Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture is taken from uh, the book of John, uh, chapter 9, uh, the first five verses. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, uh, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen. Let God add his blessing to the reading. Amen. Good morning, everybody. As you can probably tell, I am uh, not 100% today. So Terry, you may not have to wait two weeks uh, <laughs> to preach. I want to ask you to go ahead and take your Bibles, please, and turn to Ephesians 5 this morning. We're going to split chapter 5 up into two lessons. There's just so much here. There's no way we can get to it in one sermon. So we'll look at the first part of that passage this Sunday and next Sunday. Lord willing, we'll dive into uh, the latter part of chapter 5, and then we'll close out our series in a couple of weeks in chapter 6. We're just going to go straight into the text this morning. Sometimes I read the text, and then we come back and talk about it. I'm going to read the text and talk about it a little bit as we go, and then just a few points that I want to share with you this morning as you think about being uh, people of, of light and being people of thanksgiving. Uh, two prominent themes that really, really jump from this text. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we need to just stop right there and ask a quick question. Paul mentions this God example here. What example is he talking about? There's this therefore that's kind of a hinge uh, from the latter part of chapter 4 into chapter 5. And so what is, he, what is he saying here? And I think if we look back just a little bit in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we find the God example that Paul wants us to understand, and he writes there, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So here's the God example. Be kind. Be compassionate. Be forgiving. There are a lot of things that our world needs right now, but boy, do we need this just kindness and just showing more compassion and understanding that there are going to be times in my life when I'm, I'm going to make that mistake and I'm going to need your forgiveness and never losing sight of the fact that all of us will be there. And all of us, even though we didn't deserve it, we were recipients of God's amazing grace through Jesus' sacrifice. And Paul does this interesting thing in Ephesians 5. Um, it's, a, it's a, a series of contrasts, and it's, it's just amazing how he sets this up. It's, it's like a loving father guiding his children through, you may hear this, but, but I really want you to consider that. Or you may be contemplating this trajectory, but, but I really want you to think about this God path that's a much, much better alternative. And so he says these, these words, beginning in verse 3, but among you, among you, among you here in this verse is plural. Paul's speaking to the whole church. And then he lists six things in verses 3 and 4 that he, he calls disciples of Jesus to avoid. And not just avoid, he uses some qualifiers here as in not only don't do these, don't even think about it. That's how serious he is about what he lays out next here. He says, but among you, among all of you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity 
or greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Remember, if you're holy, if you're set apart, if you're sanctified. Well, we don't want to spoil that, that beauty, right? We don't want to jeopardize what we are in Christ and who we are in Christ. So Paul says, don't even flirt with it. Not even a hint of these things. He continues, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. And I put in brackets here, this is forgetting our geography. When we are people who are obscene or when we talk foolishly or, or joke coarsely, sexual joking or innuendo or, or putting others down, whatever it, whatever it may be that we have to do or feel like we have to do to, to kind of justify ourselves or make ourselves feel better about self. That's forgetting who we are, where we've been, right? Forgetting our geography. So instead of choosing sexual immorality or impurity or greed or obscenity, Another way to think about foolish talk, instead of just trivializing everything, instead of coarse joking, Paul says, choose thanksgiving. Choose thanksgiving. Because here's what happens. If we are a thankful people, if we just thank God, and, and even when times are awful, and can I get an amen? There's been some awful times. Even when times are awful, if we thank the Lord, when our minds are what I call God-focused or when our, when our hearts are Godward, uh, worshiping Him, then appeasing the desires of the flesh will not consume us. And hear me, if you go down the path of trying to appease the desires of the flesh, you will be consumed. You will be consumed. I love this quote. Brandon Fredenberg is a friend of mine. He is a professor uh, of Bible at Lubbock Christian University. And he wrote this a few years back. I came across it on his Facebook feed. I asked him if I could borrow it, and he said yes, of course. And he writes, the gospel is not the happy announcement of multiple chances to get God right or to get right with God. It is the blessed news that God in Christ has rescued us from the impenetrable darkness and error that we have fallen into because we were deceived by the originator of lies. The gospel declares that God did not, has not, and will not let his intention for creation be everlastingly thwarted by our naivete, ignorance, gullibility, stupidity, anger, hatred, meanness, and fear. God is more than able to outwit, outplay, and outlast our every attempt to outmaneuver Him, and He has in Christ, and that is the gospel. How does this play out in Ephesians when we see what Brandon described as he thought about that because the, the tendency for us is to look at other human beings and say, you are the enemy. So I want you to indulge me here just a little bit. I want you to look around the room and I want you to make eye contact with somebody. And here's what I want you to say to them. You are not my enemy. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. You are not my enemy. You're not. You're not my enemy. Now, if you had to say that through gritted teeth, we got a problem, okay? <laughs> You're not my enemy. Who is my enemy? Satan is my enemy. He's the twister of words and intentions and thoughts. He's the conniver. He's the deceiver. He's the liar. And he wants us to see the worst in each other. But a heart that is a God posture heart, a head that is God word, sees in others what Christ Jesus sees in us. Because if Christ Jesus had seen that in us and just said, well, that's my enemy, then he never would have gone to the cross. 
But his sacrifice was a sacrifice of love. Sometimes I don't get my way. That's okay. That's a sacrifice of love. Because I want the body of Christ to, to be in its fullness that which Christ gave his life for individually and collectively. Paul continues in verse 5, he says, and I want you to be sure, I want you to hear me here. He's kind of really drawing a line in the sand. This is really, this is really strong language. No, and he's talking in terms of absolutes. No, immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You go all the way back to chapter 1, and he talked about how we are inherited into the family, right? Remember, we talked a couple of Sundays ago about uh, you know, the blood of Christ as the ink on our adoption papers, right? It's kind of what seals the deal. But if we say no, I'm just going to choose the path of immorality. I'm going I'm to choose the path of idolatry. I'm going to choose the path of greed. That's, that's not the values of kingdom. So you can't be in the kingdom if you don't embrace the values of kingdom, right? You may or may not agree with all of his theology. I, I, I do not agree with all of it, but he, he spoke to a lot of people uh, over the course of his lifetime, and I thought this was one particular insight that Billy Graham offered. It was pretty profound. He said many years ago, Satan fails to speak of the remorse, the futility, the loneliness, and the spiritual devastation which go hand in hand with immorality. And it's so true. I've been in recovery communities. I've seen people at the end of their rope. I've seen the front end. Oh, this is really fun. I'm having such a great time with my friends. Or, oh, this is, this is so awesome. We're partying it up. We're living it up, whatever it might be. But I just can't think of a time that I've been at the end of someone's life who said, wow, I wish I could just have partied a little bit more, <laughs> right? But I have been at the bedside of lots of people with lots of regrets. And even then, knowing that they needed Jesus, Paul continues, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, let no one deceive you with empty words. Don't, don't buy the line of the deceiver, in other words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, don't, don't partner with them. Don't partner with them. Partner with Jesus. In Christ, church, we have been raised up um, with Jesus into new life. We've been given a new identity. One in which Christ Jesus dwells. We've, we've reached received rather we've received the indwelling holy spirit we have put on christ colossians 3 10 our citizenship is now in heaven our spirit now cries abba father as a beloved child of god romans 8 15 however however even though we have become new people spiritually we still live in the body of the old self right that old body contains the remnants of sin. We, we still have these old narratives. We still have old memories. We still have old habits. We still live in a world that stands diametrically opposed to the truth of God. And that's why we struggle. Even after we have been regenerated. The Bible describes this as a conflict of the spirit against the flesh. The word flesh, it comes from the Greek word sarx, transliteration, S-A-R-X, and that basically refers to living apart from God. Sarx is what I produce when I am disconnected from God. Sarx is what you see when I'm running the race on my own or on my own terms. Paul describes it this way in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, for the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. 
James Bryan Smith writes the following in The Good and Beautiful God, the battle between sarks and spirit does not end when we come up out of the waters of baptism. In fact, that is precisely when it begins. Repeated sinful acts result from the needs that long to be satisfied and cannot. We who are no longer under sin, Romans 6, 14, nonetheless turn to sin to find what we feel is missing. And I hope that as believers we say, I'm going to choose something different. I'm going to choose something different to run after other than the desires of the flesh. Paul is encouraging his listeners to do this in his letter. In verses 8 and 9, he says, For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So I'm going to grossly oversimplify something this morning. But it's profound if we put it into practice. And that is this. Instead of choosing darkness, choose light. Just make the choice. Life is full of choices every day, right? You got up this morning and you chose to be here or not. You got up this morning and you chose what you were going to wear. You chose which vehicle you were going to drive. Or you chose to walk or you chose to take a bike, whatever it is. Life is full of choices every single day. We make hundreds of them, sometimes possibly thousands, just in the course of a day. Every day, in your head and in your heart, choose light, not darkness. I love this transliteration from the message in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 19. This is the crisis we're in. This is how Peterson kind of transliterates this passage. God light or paraphrases rather, God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for darkness. They went for the darkness because they weren't really very interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil addicted to the denial and illusion hates God light, and they won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work that it is. There's power in the light of God. And I challenge you as my brothers and sisters of Christ, choose light. When Satan comes calling, when he comes whispering, step into the darkness. No, sorry, Satan, I'm choosing light today. I choose light. I choose to be a person of truth. As a disciple of Jesus, I choose to be a person of integrity and honesty and goodness and so on and so on. Paul continues in Ephesians 5, beginning of verse 10, and, and find out what pleases the Lord. Wow, what a great phrase, isn't it? Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's even shameful to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that's illuminated becomes a light. And that's why it said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In this beautiful, beautiful language, you know, the, the darkness is easy to want to peer over the abyss and see what's down there. It's easy to see how close we can inch and get to it without actually diving in. Right? This is a very dangerous precedent to set because there's something very alluring about the darkness. But there's a reason in the Star Wars story that it's called a lightsaber, not a dark saber. Right? Right? Because the lightsaber, the light, leads us to the truth. Paul continues, be very careful, church, how you live. Be very careful. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So instead of choosing darkness, choose light. But there's something else that Paul notes here. Instead of choosing ignorance, choose wisdom. What is the root word of the word ignorance? Say it out loud. Ignore. Ignore. Don't ignore the truth of God. Don't ignore God's truth. Choose wisdom. We know the difference between wisdom and knowledge, right? Knowledge is what we know. Wisdom is how we use what we know. 
So Paul is pointing out here, you know who you are in Christ. How are you going to use that knowledge to glorify him and be light people versus people of darkness? The text continues, therefore, don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So, choose light, not darkness. Choose wisdom, not ignorance. Paul says here, choose being filled with the Spirit, not being filled with spirits. Okay? The old phrase for alcoholic beverages, uh, the spirits, right? What they call them. So Paul says, don't be filled with spirits. Be filled with the Spirit. And one of the primary ways that this gets played out in the text, at least in the Ephesians church, and I think this is a, a timeless encouragement from Paul, speak to one another in hymns, psalms, songs from the Spirit. I just think that's such a beautiful phrase. There's something that's just so pure and holy and right about encouraging one another through the blessed gift of song. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Such a powerful, again, beautiful phrase. Always giving thanks to God the Father through everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what do you know? The text comes full circle. Here we are once again giving thanks. So as you wrestle with this text, there's several things I want to encourage you to do. And as I said, we're going to come back next Sunday and look at the last part of chapter 5 and pull some of these themes that we've seen today into that text as well. Um, but there's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind, not just for this next week, but continue thinking about these things. Uh, one is I want you to consider being thankful, and that's actually misspelled on purpose. Be full of thanks. Be thankful. And be lightful believers. You know, wouldn't it be great if one of the, one of the uh, compliments you got is, you are so delightful. You're just full of light. What a great blessing that would be. So I, I want to encourage you, feed your spirit first and foremost. You know, we've seen the prayers of Paul in the book of Ephesians, and we've seen the encouragement. But there is this feeding of our spirit. It, it, it makes the things of darkness less attractive to us. Uh, sin is demystified when we are walking in the Spirit of God. So feed your spirit, church. Be kind. Be compassionate. Be forgiving. These are choices that we can make as well. Choose thankfulness. It's hard for me to hold a grudge against you if I'm thankful for what Christ Jesus has done in my life. It's hard for me to be upset with you for too long. Oh, sure, we may disagree on something, but I can't hold on to that because Christ probably disagrees with a lot of the decisions that I make in my life, but he doesn't hold on to it. He allows his blood to wash over it and forgive. Choose light, and even as Paul encourages us here, choose the Spirit-filled life. And as we are in pursuit of these things, something amazing happens, and that is we begin to see more clearly, which is one of the things that light allows us to do, right? Allows us to do. And uh, certainly, certainly, as we are people who not just avoid the darkness, but uh, we don't even want the least little bit to do with it, according to the text. I appreciate you listening this morning and going into the text with me. Thank you for bearing with me and in my infirmity. <laughs> I appreciate that very, very much. We're going to share a song together right now if this text has convicted you this morning uh, that maybe you've just been in darkness for too long and you're tired. You're tired of being alone. You're tired of the struggle. Uh, why not be baptized this morning? Have all your sins washed away. Start your life anew today in Christ. Perhaps you been a believer, a baptized believer for many, many years now, but, but the voice of Satan came calling, and you listened, and you gave in, and you need prayers for strength and prayers for forgiveness. There may be something else on your heart this morning, a prayer need for uh, uh, healing or uh, encouragement, uh, whatever that is, uh, a couple of our shepherds will be down front, would love to meet you down here, uh, or as we said before, you can even turn to the person beside you. Make your request known to them, and they'll help connect you to the right person. Let's stand together, church. Let's sing.
Thank you.